we'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Financial Planning Considerations When Moving to Florida. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We're going to be taking questions throughout, so feel free, there's a section here on your panel. You can type in any questions that you might have. We're going to have time for a Q&A at the end. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. If we don't have time to answer your question, one of the panelists will get back to you after the webinar with an answer. So a little bit about today's speakers. With us today, we have Connie Eckerly from Smolin. Connie is a licensed um, certified public accountant with Smolin. We also have Henry Rinder with us today. Henry also is a licensed certified public accountant. And then we also have Jeffrey Weinstein. Jeffrey is an attorney and special counsel at Cole Shots and the Tax Trust and the State Department. He counsels those with business and personal interests in the greater New York City metropolitan area in South Florida. And with that, I'll pass things along to Henry, who's today's moderator. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I, I really uh, appreciate having Connie and Jeff on, the, on, the, uh, on our panel today. Uh, uh, Jeff is a pretty knowledgeable uh, attorney in, in the area of uh, multi-tax multi uh, uh, interstate kind of um, issues. And Connie is one of our partners in our uh, South Florida office, and she constantly addresses uh, clients' needs in this space. So we have a couple of very knowledgeable folks here with us. Um, Amanda, let's move to the agenda, please. Thank you. So we're going to basically discuss the highlights of the issues involving uh, moving your residency to Florida. So we, we'll talk about uh, proof of residency, what are the tax implications that you would face. Uh, we'll address retirement planning, like what happens to your uh, pensions and 401k uh, distributions and so on. We'll talk about, you know, what are the common pitfalls uh, in uh, moving your residency to Florida. And finally, uh, we'll uh, wrap it up with some estate planning uh, tips. Uh, to consider as part of uh, the consideration uh, in a move from either New Jersey or New York or Connecticut to Florida. Having said that, uh, um, Amanda, could we go to the next slide? Uh, I'll turn over to Connie, uh, who covered the proof of residency uh, area. Connie? Thank you, Henry. So first, let's talk about domicile. A domicile is defined as the place that someone intends to be their permanent home. Uh, residence itself is the physical presence in a state. But with regard to domicile, it not only requires your physical presence in the state, but it also requires the intent to make that state your fixed or permanent home. Uh, you actually have an intent to leave the land or leave the state that you are um, you know, leaving. In many cases, it's showing that you're looking for a, a lifestyle change in a lot of cases. A person can really only have one domicile. Um, the, for residency purposes or domicile purposes, they talk, there's five very important uh, factors. They call them the five primary factors. The first one is your home. You know, where is your home? And what what is the size and the value of your home? In New York, I'm going to use. I'm just going to say New York, but obviously New York and New Jersey uh, can be used interchangeably. Um, and what is the size of that New York home, and how does it compare to your home in Florida? You know, still owning the large home, a family home in New York, and renting a small townhouse in Florida, you know, that may not support your intent to actually leave New New York. They also consider the nature of use of these residences and are you you know how are you using that home are you treating it more like a vacation home like a beach house or is it really the majority of the time you're spending there and really treating it like your home the second factor is your business dealings right your active business involvement you know what agents like to see here is you know maybe you're transitioning to retirement and when that happens, they want to start seeing you divest yourself from the, the business that you might have in New York. So that helps to support, you know, leaving the state of New York and your business there. The third primary factor is the time spent. Where is your time spent? You know, while spending 183 days or fewer 
um, in, in New York prevents you from paying income tax as a statutory resident, um, the amount of time you spend in Florida is also very important. Some people think it's just as long as you're out of the state of New York for 183 days, that's good. Not necessarily. You really have to spend more time in, in Florida. So, you know, if you spend, for example, five months in New York, three months in Florida, and the remaining four months traveling, or maybe even at a third home somewhere, it could be argued that you really never left New York and that Florida is really is acting more like a vacation home. So you really need to show that you live in Florida most of the time. The fourth factor is um, items that are near and dear. And, and this is very important because where are your items of sentimental value maintained? This is a very heavily weighted factor. And they, they want to see that you moved your photo albums down to Florida and your family heirlooms and maybe your works of art. I mean, these things are, they really do look at these near and dear items. Lastly, the fifth factor is your family connections. And this pretty much only really applies to when you have minor children, but where are your minor children enrolled in school? And these five factors, um, you know, it, proving these five factors, it's facts and circumstances, and the burden of proof is on you, the taxpayer, to prove that. So keep these five factors in mind when, when establishing your domicile. There are quite a few secondary factors that come into play. Um, and, um, and although not deciding factors, but they are still very important. They contribute to your intent to domicile. And some of these include, in what state do you hold your driver's license? Um, where are you registered to vote? And are you actually voting there? And where is your homestead exemption filed? Uh, things like location of your safe deposit box with your important uh, family records. Um, also, your active involvement in organizations and country clubs. And lastly, when you your will and your trust uh, and some of your legal documents, you want to make sure when they cite the, the place of domicile, you want to make sure that you get that legally changed in your documents to Florida. Um, I'm going to jump into statutory residency. Um, there are two components of that. Uh, residency is your physical presence, right? Your day count in the state and you must also have a primary or a permanent place of abode. Um, so those are the two components. First, you must pass your 183-day test. Well, even if you're successful in changing your domicile to Florida, if you return to New York for more than 180 day, 183 days during a calendar year and maintain a home, you'll actually be classified as a statutory resident under the state's tax law. Um, so keeping track of the 183 days is critical. A minute in New York is a day in New York. And the only exceptions really that, that the state allows is really travel and medical. So let's say, for example, you're traveling uh, through New York to get to an airport, or you have a quick layover in New York heading, in, heading somewhere else. That will not count as a day in New York. And the second one is um, medical. So let's say you're, you're a Florida resident and you go up to New York to visit the grandchildren and you get physically hurt and you are in the hospital. The time that you spend in the hospital will not count towards your 183 days. So record keeping is very important. It's recommended that you keep a log. Um, state auditors often will check cell phone records credit card statements, easy pass activity. So you have to be able to prove, um, you know, where you were on certain days. Now, one of the things to do, or, or let's talk a little bit of what you need to do when you get to Florida. Um, the most important thing is, uh, one of the most important things is to go to your um, clerk of court in the county that you reside and record a Florida Declaration of Domicile in their official records um, done right at the courthouse. 
Um, and then if you do that before December 31st, then you have up until March 1st to file for a homestead exemption on that Florida property. Um, and then, and again, another critical is to make sure that you execute estate planning documents uh, that reflect Florida um, as your place of residence. And lastly, the secondary factors that we talked about before, uh, you, you want to consider complying with those as well. Henry? Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? I think that's also something that, Kanye, you're going to cover for us. Yes, I will. Thank you. So, um, under the for tax implications, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed in December of 2017 um, limited what the state and local tax deduction. Um, the maximum deduction is is ten thousand dollars, and that includes property tax. And in a in a state that has state income tax, it includes the state income tax, and in Florida, it's sales tax. So this limitation significantly reduced the deduction, therefore making it not as advantageous to pay all those taxes. When you consider property taxes in two states, income tax in New Jersey or New York, um, clearly well below, I'm sorry, clearly well above $10,000. The top rates for the federal um, tax bracket is 37%, with Florida not having any state income tax. New Jersey having state tax of about 9% in New York, um, the state about 7% in New York City, uh, another 4%. Losing these deductions has a large impact on your tax liability. So the issue of, um, so the SALT um, deduction limitation um, is a big driving factor for people to move to a state without income tax. Um, as a Florida resident, in the year in the year that you, if you're now a Florida resident, but it's partial year, in the year that you move to Florida, um, you will have a part year income tax return, reflecting the income that you earned in New York or New Jersey for that time period that you were in that state. Uh, so you will have a part year tax return uh, for that state. If you're now a Florida resident, and you have income that may be sourced in New York or New Jersey, you have to file a non-resident return um, and allocate that income accordingly and pay tax to that state on the income that is sourced in that state. In addition, if you have, um, if you're a Florida resident and you have wages in New York, you're required to allocate, allocate those wages to New York based on the time that you're working there and working in that respective state and deriving income from those services. And then the last, just to touch lightly upon uh, the considerations for sale of principal residence. If you're gonna sell your New York or New Jersey home, bear in mind that the IRS allows you to have an exemption of $250,000 per person, 500,000 for a married couple. But you have to sell that home, to get that exclusion, you have to sell that home within, while that home was your primary residence and you lived in it for two of the last five years. So timing of selling that home um, needs to be considered in order to get that exclusion. Henry? Uh, next slide, please. So I think this is uh, uh, the section that uh, describes retirement uh, planning. And uh, for this particular topic, we're gonna uh, turn it over to Jeff. Jeff? Yeah, thanks, Henry. And uh, Connie, you, you did a very nice job running through. I know it's difficult with uh, 15 minutes to get through all of this. Uh, even before I get to the uh, retirement income, I just wanna just touch on a couple points uh, for just a few minutes on on some of the things to also consider. Mostly, and, and I do a lot of residency audits um, with both uh, New Jersey, but more so with New York. Uh, the issue is always with owning two, you know, two residents in the state. 
And I think the primary thing that at least I know in New York audits they look at is whether you've really abandoned the former dom domicile. And that, that becomes a critical issue. And, you know, certainly, although the, they look at all of those five primary factors, in my experience, that's the most significant one coupled with the amount of time that you're spending. Uh, the other thing, you know, it's a very fact-sensitive analysis. I mean, some of the things they look at are, for example, where your physicians are located. Uh, it becomes difficult when you say, hey, my, you know, New York residence is, or the co-op or condo is a vacation home when all your doctors are in New York. Because, you know, an auditor is going to say, well, you know, when you normally go on vacation, do you make scheduled visits to the doctor? So things like that, you really have to keep in mind, making sure your mail and everything uh, is all, you know, addressed to Florida. You really have to be all in. Um, the other one point I also want to make on day count, a lot of people have the misconception, well, you know, how are they going to prove I'm here or there? Uh, the burden is entirely on the taxpayer. And any day that the taxpayer cannot prove their presence is out of New York or New Jersey will be deemed to be in that state. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of ways uh, that you can track your movement. Uh, they will do it for you in some instances by subpoenaing your phone records. You can also get apps, uh, make certain transactions. Uh, because when it comes down to it, you really have to have uh, complete fastidious records of your whereabouts, uh, assuming you can get over domicile. So getting now to retirement income deferred compensation, this is kind of what I would call the third phase of, of an audit, if you will. So first they'll look at domicile, which, which we discussed. Then they'll look at if you've overcome the domicile and you can show you're no longer domiciled in the state, then they'll look at statutory residency. Assuming you get over that, then what they're looking at, when I say they, I mean either New York or New Jersey, uh, Department of Taxation or Division of Taxation, they look at, well, okay, you're a non-resident, and what or how is your income sourced as a non-resident? So when you, when you look at the uh, retirement income or deferred compensation, uh, you look at pension and annuity income. Now, you know, I give New Jersey credit. New Jersey has legislated and has made uh, generally an exclusion, although it's a cliff, uh, in 2020 up to $100,000 of retirement income. So if you're not, you know, in a situation where you're going to be receiving income over uh, $100,000, you may not need to move to Florida because you, your income, if it's just retirement income under that threshold, is not going to be taxed. Um, however, uh, for those clients or professionals that have clients that have substantial pension annuity, IRA uh, income, this becomes a big issue. And under federal law uh, that I have listed in the slide, PL 109-264, uh, that income cannot be taxed if you're uh, no longer a New Jersey or New York resident. So it's kind of a safe harbor uh, to exclude that income. And that's, that can be a major reason for uh, moving to out of uh, New York or New Jersey. Uh, now, when you look at the other three items, bonus, severance, stock options, basically, you know, what's presented on the screen is how New York under its rules will tax income that's been earned or vested in the, in the state of where you were a resident or where the employer's lo located and then how it's taxed once you're a non-resident. So I think it's just important to keep in mind that for example, New York, if you have a bonus that's earned in one year and paid in another, may still be allocable to the, or to say, for example, for New York, even if it's paid in the year that you're a non-resident. Uh, same with severance, uh, stock options, there's very specific rules for New York. Now, 
Uh, there's also something called the accrual rule, which uh, New York uses, which basically treats you from a cash basis taxpayer to an accrual method taxpayer for, again, income that may have been earned while you were a resident. Uh, the takeaway for this is there are things you can do. And if you are in a position where you have some negotiation or leverage to structure deferred compensation when you're you know, going out the door, uh, you might be able to structure it so that it's for future performance instead of past performance and thus avoid having it being accrued or, or, or determined as sourced in New York or New Jersey. Um, we could go to the next slide. I, I think in very interesting issues have come up uh, with telecommuting that as a result of the, the pandemic and the COVID uh, that are very, you know, unique and is really bringing the issue of telecommuting right to the forefront. Um, Henry and I were discussing that there's even some possible legislation to deal with it. But the basic idea, as Connie stated, that generally, uh, when you're a non-resident, your wages are taxed based on where the, the services are performed. Now, there's, a, there's an exception to this, uh, and that is where you talk about the convenience of the employer test. So, for example, even if you're a Florida resident and you work for a New York employer, uh, and let's put the, the pandemic and all that aside, because that, that raises uh, issues that really haven't been squarely addressed by the tax authorities. But prior to that, uh, if, even if you were a resident of Florida, if, you were, if you're working for a New York company, uh, you're going to be subject to paying 100% of your income to New York regardless of where you're doing the work. So even if you're working from home, you're going to be subject to that. And that, that's under a, a very lengthy and well-settled history of cases defining what's called the convenience of employer rules. And those are uh, enacted in Delaware, Nebraska, New York, um, Pennsylvania, Connecticut for purposes of a residency credit for 2019. New Jersey is a little bit unclear, but most practitioners believe that they're also following the convenience of the employer rule. So again, that's important, particularly where you have a, the state from which you're working from if it doesn't have an income tax. Uh, because, for example, if you're a New Jersey resident and you're working for a New York employer, uh, assuming you don't have a permanent place of abode in, in New York and you're not subject to New York City tax, it's really not going to make a huge difference because your, you know, your New York employer is withholding the, the income tax. Uh, you file your New Jersey resident return and you take a credit. So it's really, you know, New York and New Jersey sort of battling it out behind the scenes as who's entitled to that money. Uh, but in the in with regard to if you're working out of Texas, Florida, or other states that don't have an income tax, it makes a huge difference because you don't get a credit on the return. So you want to be aware of that now. There has been legislation, uh, or I should say, not legislation, but in the form of TSB that gives non-residents the ability to uh, allocate out of New York if certain conditions are met. And uh, there's a TSB, and I can send that to you. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I just want to uh, get to the next slide uh, on that. And by the way, uh, if you want any information regarding any of these topics, you can email me at G Weinstein, W E I N S T E I N, at coleshots.com, and I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Uh, the last thing that I just want to mention here is typically uh, when you get estate planning documents and they're, and they're done uh, in Florida, like for example, I work out of the, our BOCA office, typically you use Rev Trust, okay? Uh, what I did want to just talk about very briefly is what about residents of New Jersey or New York who may later become non-residents, but right now, uh, for either practical reasons or, or other reasons, uh, they're not able to do it. What, what can you do? Are there, 
are there trusts that can be set up to uh, minimize state uh, income tax? And there, there, there are significant uh, steps you can take that will save uh, money uh, or avoid or minimize state taxes by setting up certain trusts. The trusts you don't want to set up for this are what are called grantor trusts. Uh, if you're in a position where you're able to set up what is called a non-grantor trust, uh, typically because of Nevada state laws, we call it a Nevada Incomplete Gift Non-Grantor Trust, or a NING, that can be a, a tremendous vehicle to reduce state income taxes, particularly for New Jersey residents rather than New York. And uh, the reason for that is New York has sort of uh, figured out this technique and has legislated against it. But for New Jersey residents, uh, if you're able to set up a trust and you, you your client does not the distributions of that money uh, in the current year, uh, there's it's just a great technique uh, to have what's called an incomplete gift, which allows the uh, trust to be funded by the seller without triggering a gift tax. And it also provides asset protection and you can get a step up in basis. Uh, so that's a like i said it's a great tool uh the other uh in new york you can do what's called a, a completed gift trust which is another way to to minimize tax but instead of an incomplete gift it's a completed gift uh so i i wanted to leave a few minutes for henry to, to either ask questions i didn't even mean to go this long but uh but henry go ahead if, if you want to add any further commentary thank you jeff um Great uh, presentation. Uh, usually we turn to the next slide, which is probably uh, the questions from the audience uh, slide. And uh, we turn to Amanda to see if we have any questions uh, coming from, from the participants. Amanda? Yes, so one of the questions that we had was someone was asking how far in advance realistically they should start planning these pieces, um, you know, knowing that there's certain requirements for how many days and how far they should be planning and moving everything. Jeff, would you like to take a uh, step at this question? How far in advance sure. they should? Start? Yeah, as, uh, you know, as soon as you know, you should start stake, taking steps. And one of the reasons why is particularly if you want to take advantage of the Florida homestead, you need to file that for the current year by March 1st, which is a helpful tool. Um, but you know what? People have their own schedules. You can do it halfway through the year. You can do it, you know, uh, if you can do it way out, even better. What we don't like to see is if a transaction is a major transaction is closing and you do it during the same tax year. That's usually a recipe for disaster. I would like to add something to it. Actually, uh, Call Shots, uh, Jeff's law firm, uh, has published a, a very uh, informative uh, handout on this very topic, and it has loads of uh, uh, tips and recommendations on how best to uh, address the uh, you know move move from one state to another. So I'm sure Jeff, uh, if Somebody wants to email you. You can you can send them the PDF version of it. Um, it's it's quite informative. Um, and and frankly, to Jeff's point, um, obviously, if you there there's certain transactions that can be planned ahead, where you could possibly save. You can potentially save either New York uh, or New Jersey taxes. But that, that requires advanced planning. Last minute is not a good idea under, under no circumstances. Um, and, and to that end, you, you should be talking to somebody like Jeff or us uh, in terms of uh, planning ahead. Uh, Amanda, what's, uh, any other questions? Yeah, one of the questions was regarding the, the trust. It's they had just was wondering that you could provide a little bit more detail about what the options were. I know we're short on time and we're trying to fit in um, a lot, but just what the recommendations were for those. 
Jeff? Sure. Uh, it, it's a very fact-sensitive analysis. Uh, we do it all the time. Uh, but like I said, the preferred method in New Jersey is a Nevada uh, incomplete gift tax trust. It really requires a meeting to really understand the type of transaction that you're contemplating. Where it works best is the sale of stock or uh, an intangible interest, which is important to know as opposed to an asset sale. So that's another reason, to Henry's point, you really want to plan ahead uh, so, because it could affect how you, how you structure a transaction or the type of assets that these trusts hold. We, uh, we had 3.30 marked, so let's take one more question, and, and then any other questions that remain unanswered will circulate to the panelists, and we will try to get back to you directly. Amanda? Sure. So it, one of the questions was, if a married couple files jointly for federal taxes, can one person claim Florida residency? So if you, if you have, uh, the question is, if you have uh, a situation where, I'm trying to kind of dissect the question, you have a joint return for federal purposes, one person is a resident, solid resident of Florida, another person is not, and, and perhaps is a resident of New York or resident of New Jersey, how do you deal with it? So, Connie, why don't you take a stab at it, and maybe Jeff can uh, supplement your answer if necessary. Well, you can. I mean, it's it, you can uh, do a, a, a married filing separate, I'm assuming. Well, a married filing joint, one as a Florida resident and one as a New York. Um, you have to look at the states. We'd have to specifically look at the states, but I, I, I know there are, it happens. It happens frequently. And, and in terms of the statutory residency versus part-time residency, you know, if you, if you have somebody that um, estab establishes a residency during the year, for example, uh, I think you mentioned um, something about it earlier in the in presentation, Connie, where you would have a resident return in New York or New Jersey in the beginning of the year, and and then, if if necessary, non-resident return for the remainder of the year, even if 183 days um, is exceeded, uh, providing that there's some other measurements of residency that happened the following year. Is that correct? That's correct. So in the year that you move to Florida, um, you can almost guarantee that. I mean, you you will have a part year return uh, for the time that you spent. It's it, that is the transition year, whether it's 183 days or not, because you've now left that state, and you will have a part year in in the current year, um, and then the following year, then your 183 days really comes into play. Correct. Uh, Jeff, would you like to supplement any of that? Because obviously that first year creates some opportunities, but I'll, I'll let you uh, comment on it if you wish. Sure. It's, it's very common. Uh, I agree with what Connie, Connie said. I mean, most, most people aren't able to, you know, or, or don't establish residency on the first of the day of the year, 1-1. One, one. Uh, so you, you do end up filing uh, part year returns. Uh, and sometimes, by the way, even if it doesn't change the, the income tax con consequences to that, uh, the optics are sometimes good. So I, I, I may sometimes advise clients, even if they're going to end up paying 100% of their income to New York or New Jersey, uh, to file um, as a non-resident if they change their domicile, say, in December. Uh, so at least they sort of you know, put their foot in the door and the, the face of the return shows the Florida address and all of that. So uh, in the next year, if they're audited, uh, you know, you can show, hey, this was a situation where they had contemplated a uh, change of domicile in the, early, you know, in the last year, even if they ended up paying 100% of state tax. So uh, sometimes you do it for that reason as well. Well, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Connie. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, really appreciate uh, your narrative and your input. Uh, I wanted to thank the participants uh, for joining us uh, today. As I mentioned before, your questions that were that, that were not considered um, by the panel, uh, we will circulate them to the panelists and we'll uh, get back to you with an answer to your questions. 
Thank you, Amanda, for hosting it, and have a good day, everyone.